This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. Today, Professor Jan Lippard tells us about how new technologies can help preserve our privacy while allowing us to share information with others. He's particularly interested in sharing health information in a way that protects privacy when disclosing sensitive information about, for example, infectious disease history, mental health, or reproductive health. It's the future of health privacy. We are all used to disclosing private information to our physicians so that they can diagnose our health problems and provide therapies. Sometimes those interactions are difficult because we may be discussing very sensitive information about our health that we may not want our friends or loved ones, and especially not our government, to know. This may be, for example, about past sexually transmitted diseases or mental health challenges. It, is it possible to create technologies to share that information with healthcare providers while also having privacy guarantees? That seems impossible, but there are emerging technologies that allow us to share information with others while guaranteeing one, that it never leaves our phone or our computer, and two, that it is used by algorithms to give us a health advice, and three, that the healthcare providers do not necessarily need to see the information unless we explicitly authorize them to do it. Jan Lippard is a professor of bioengineering at Stanford University. He studies these cryptography techniques that can improve the privacy of health information. And he has enabled the creation of apps that help patients without having to have the data leave their phone. Your work looks at privacy preserving technologies, especially for healthcare, but also in other settings. What is the problem you see and why is this such an important problem? Oh, well, first of all, um, I'm, uh, first of all, good morning, Russ, it's super to see you. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm one of many people at Stanford who care about these technologies. And there's many more people who are much better at the fundamentals than I am, people in, in computer science, um, people like Dan Benet and Gil Bejarano. So I'm really coming at this from someone who's interested primarily in healthcare primarily interested in, in digital health. And what I'm really interested in is the intersection of providing good diagnoses and good health care with privacy. And that's really caught my attention. Um, uh, and let me ask you a general question, uh, Russ. Have you ever lied to your doctor? Have I ever lied? Well, so the first question is, do I ever talk to my doctor? But yes. <laughs> Um, I try not to lie to my doctor, but as you know, I am a doctor, and so I'm very well aware of the importance of kind of having good data. I have, I can imagine, but, but let me just say yes, because there are questions that are fuzzy, like about how much you exercise, or <laughs> stuff like that, or how are you eating, where I th or how much wine do you drink, where I might have, I, I might have modified the truth. Yeah, and uh, that, that's not only you. I think that's a general feature of, um, you know, people feel sheepish about things, and so they, they, they round the numbers and so forth. But that's just one example where questions of privacy and questions of healthcare sort of intersect. Um, what really caught my attention a few years ago is a set of technologies that you might call like privacy-preserving analytics. And at first sight, they sound like complete magic. Because all of us are used to what you might call the sort of fundamental transaction of healthcare, which is I go to a doctor, I tell him or her everything. Um, they plus or minus they, the truth. Plus or minus <laughs> the truth. Um, they they think and look and contemplate, and then they return a diagnosis, uh, hopefully. And so that's really a transaction that involves me divulging information, and I get something in return, like a diagnosis. And the technologies that caught my attention a few years ago, these privacy preserving analytics techniques, they really sound like magic because fundamentally what they allow people to do is take some data, encrypt it, send the encrypted data to someone else, some other computer, to a doctor. Um, that party can compute on them, extract insights and send the result back to me. And the magic part is that the data were always encrypted, and I'm the only person who can see the result. I'm the only person who can see the diagnosis. And that's a fundamental change, a fundamental technology change, a fundamental geometry change in healthcare 
Um, you know, since people have been asking other people for advice about their health. So it's a real step change in those, in those interactions. So, so let, me ma let me make sure I understand the problem that you're identifying. So most people are okay um, giving private information to their physician because, first of all, there's an expectation of privacy after you give it to the physician, and you can comment on that about whether that expectation is reality-based. But also, as you said, in, there's value associated with it because I give information that perhaps as a patient, I have no idea what its significance is. And the physician with that information processes it and turns it into value, value by giving me a diagnosis or a treatment or, or, or just reassurance that everything is fine. So wh wh where is the thing that we're worried about? in terms of the loss of privacy uh, and, and how do we do this calculation about the value of the, the value added of the physician's thinking versus our worry about what we've just disclosed? Well, that's a, that's a lot to unpack. Um, Go for it. Yeah. What, what you're describing is a sort of idealized version of healthcare where we have a doctor, we've been working with him or her for 20 years, we trust them. Um, but most people's reality is quite different. Um, imagine you're a 12 year old girl and you're looking for abortion providers and you're doing that with a search engine. Um, imagine you're an undergraduate at a university and you're, um, you may have mental health questions or concerns. Okay. Um, are there barriers to uh, seeking care? Um, you might be a doctor wanting to provide healthcare services in dozens of countries. Um, do you really have the bandwidth to deal with lawyers, to deal with data compliance issues um, across the world? And those are just um, sort of three first stabs at where privacy and, and healthcare intersect. I see. Okay. So thank you. You, uh, you took me out of my land of all is well back into the real world of like, there are challenges for many people in terms of the sensitivity of sensitivity of the information. Okay. So let's early in the conversation, let's get out of the way, at least a basic understanding of what these technologies do. So can you take me through the, the basic capabilities that you're excited about and that you think need to be introduced into the healthcare system, at least for those situations that you just described, where things are very sensitive. Yeah, um, without, um, well, the, the, if you really, if you care about the technologies, um, you should take lots of amazing classes at Stanford CS. Very good. Um, but um, a very simple way to think about this is um, both of us um, on this podcast right now, we could compute our average age without any one of us divulging our actual age. And the way we would do this is both of us would, in our heads, take our age, we would add a random number, and we would share um, those noisy numbers. Um, we would compute the average, and the average would be an estimate um, of our average age because noise cancels. Um, that sort of technique really only works for a large number of people but um, there are Wait, many... uh, I see, because if we did it, you and I might add random numbers that are unrelated, and therefore the, the estimate would be very bad. But over thousands of people, some people would reduce, some people would increase, and on average, they would be getting the, the answer pretty much in, in, correct. That's exactly right. Okay. So for example, um, you, you could uh, obtain an almost perfect estimate of the average blood pressure of people living in the U.S., uh, without any one individual needing to transmit their actual blood pressure reading to you. That's a really highly simplified toy example, but that gets some of the concepts across. And is there a name for this technology that you just described? So um, some of the key technologies are things like secure multi-party computation and things like fully homomorphic encryption. And those are all um, the sort of key things under this umbrella of privacy preserving compute or analytics. And the principle is you want to collaborate with others to make some computations, but you don't quite trust them to have your information. So there's a, a certain level of trust, like, yes, we should work together, but uh -huh. not the here, take the, the crown jewels. Here's all everything. And so this offers an, um, an intermediate. Tell me if I'm right. This offers an intermediate ground where I can collaborate with people without having full trust. Correct. So some of these technologies actually come from the government world where certain agencies collect very sensitive data, but they don't like to work together. <laughs> and a need was identified to connect the dots. 
and yes. um, enable those parties to um, uh, connect and find patterns without necessarily opening their databases to their um, fiercest rivals. Um, gotcha. Okay, so let's let's go into an example because I know you've done a uh, you've published a paper uh, looking at COVID symptoms, and I think that this is an example of the kind of applications that that kind of motivated you. So, can you take us through what was that COVID nineteen experiment? How is it going, and what what was learned? Uh, very good. Yeah. So we worked with the Gates Foundation to launch a very simple um, COVID symptom screener. And we worked with a social networking company to get our survey in front of lots of people in 93 different countries. And we used secure multi-party computation to compute on their symptoms and extract um, basically do a geospatial analysis and a time course um, of symptoms in different countries. Okay, so let's, let's unpack that because that sounds really good. So first of all, is the question here, what are the clinical manifestations of COVID or who might be having COVID and not even realize it? What, what is the thing that Gates was excited about as, a, as, a somebody, as an organization committed to healthcare? One thing that was uh, exciting for Gates is the um, sort of compliance angle which is that imagine you want to make the world healthier. Like one of the practical problems there is you have to deal with 200 plus different healthcare systems. And if you, let's just say, Russ, you invented an app that was able to diagnose a top 10 medical condition based on a few simple questions, and you wanted to give this to everyone around the world to use. Uh, the very next thing you'd run into is a incredibly complex regulatory thicket. And there's a simple solution to that, which is you never actually take anyone's data. You leave the data on their phone. And there, there, are, other, um, there are other benefits to the technology, but um, it's just being able to roll out, being able to scale digital health solutions um, well is probably one of the most attractive ones. Okay, so how many people tried out this, um, this uh, survey? Uh, did you learn anything about COVID or was it mostly about the underlying uh, privacy technology? Um, we had at, at the end, when we, when we basically um, spun down the survey, we had something like 20 million submissions um, from 93 different countries. And the thing we were trying to do, the, the, the healthcare question we were yeah. asking is, um, what is the constellation of symptoms that is most predictive of a subsequent positive test? Gotcha. This was in the dark ages of COVID where symptom, potential symptoms were flying around left and right. Remember yes. blue toes and loss of smell and hacking cough, yes. wet cough, fever, like all of these things. And the, the question we had is, is there, a, is there a way to select symptoms in such a way as to um, predict uh, a, a subsequent test, a positive test? Okay, great. Uh, and you had a ton of data and all of that data was left, is, is it true that it was all left on their phones and you just did this kind of, as you described earlier, this magical adding that didn't require you to have the data? Is that, was that a, an exactly example right. of that? So um, we here in California um, had none of the raw answers from the individuals. And, and, and yet you had reliable summaries. And yet we had reliable um, summaries. And it was super confusing for people. We had people email us and they say, Jan, I'm scared what you're doing with the data. Please delete the data. And we said, we don't have your data. And then they said, um, uh, and, and then it got very confusing uh, because um, we only ever learned about those individuals when they emailed us to request their data being deleted. Because before, we certainly had no idea who the participants were and what their names were. Uh, but it's only once they reached out to get their data deleted that we actually um, you know, saw someone's name ever. And that seems like it might be a profound challenge for these technologies. You know, people like to rely on their common sense. And what you've described, uh, even though it's technically, you know, it's been peer reviewed and it's technically, you know, 
very reasonable. Uh, it doesn't match the common person's understanding of how things work in the world in terms of how do you add two numbers without having the two numbers, right? That's just kind of a yep. basic thing from third grade. <laughs> Uh, does that have more uh, pr uh, profound implications, though, about getting, I guess, institutional buy-in to these technologies or either or even government uh, assent to the use of these technologies? You said that some the government is using these in other settings for security, so that might help a little bit. But I'm guessing that the people who regulate healthcare uh, in the, in the U.S. may not be familiar with these technologies. So, what is the status of these technologies in terms of acceptability to the existing institutions? That's a really great question. Um, there's probably a significant lack of awareness and understanding of the technologies. And, uh, you know, if you're at a university, typically what you say is, oh, you know, uh, things aren't ready yet. They need to be improved. Uh, more research is needed. But what was exciting to me personally is that we were able to um, take these technologies and um, have a very large number of people use them and things didn't crash and things sort of worked as expected. Um, I imagine it's going to take a few more years before um, there, there is a broader awareness, for example, at the FDA and um, in the healthcare system um, of the tools. Um, and uh, I, I'd certainly, I, I'd be very happy, however, if um, there was much broader use of, of these tools. This is the future of everything with Russ Altman. More with Jan Lippart next. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Jan Lippart from Stanford University. In the last segment, Jan described the technologies that allow for secure and private sharing of information and how he was able to use this to gather information from millions of patients related to their COVID symptoms without ever having the information leave their phones or computers. In this segment, Jan will tell us that we probably don't appreciate the full value of our own data and that these same technologies that he's using for health may also be used in other areas and may remove internet companies as intermediaries who gather and sell our data. It would change the economics of the internet big time. Uh, but, but Jan, I want to ask you, it sounds to me like these might have broader uses than just healthcare. And, and I think you've thought about those and have opinions about them. So I wanted to ask you, what else could these kinds of technologies be used for that might get people fired up? Ah, yeah, that's, that's a big question. Um, if you think about the internet, um, where it's ended up right now is not at all what it was invented to do. And what we, what we have these days uh, with the internet is we basically have this um, global funnel of data uh, that is coming from individuals and ultimately used for um, targeted advertising. The idea is to be able to uh, sell you exactly uh, what you want. Um, and if you, if you think about how that system evolved, um, all of us take it for granted that um, we do have to divulge information to get stuff. A great example would be a loan. Um, if you go to a bank and say, hey, um, give me some money, then of course uh, they'll come back with a long list of questions, your income and where you live and your education, all these things. Um, so things like insurance, uh, loans, banking, um, education, um, maybe you want recommendations about books you like to read. Um, so th there's basically every single time you interact with a computer, you're used to directly or indirectly divulging information to get stuff that you care about. And what's interesting- And usually about, you're giving that away, that information. And usually you're giving uh, that information uh, just away for free. Uh, there, there's there's a funny anecdote, which is uh, if 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 I give a lecture on privacy, I always ask, um, "Hey, do you care about privacy?" And people raise their hand and they say, "Of course, uh, we all love privacy." And then I say, um, "But what if I gave you a free piece of pizza, about three bucks worth?" And then people say, "Oh, of course, you know." In return for this amazing piece of pizza, I'll tell you everything. <laughs> um, Yes. So, and, and that's, um, it's, it's really unfortunate because it turns out that um, uh, basically everyone likes privacy, but very few people want to pay for it. So the, the value they assign to their data is typically very low. 
When Microsoft bought LinkedIn, the value of every LinkedIn profile uh, was approximately $125. That's what Microsoft paid for your LinkedIn profile. Wow. But most people don't realize that, you know, just filling out a basic uh, profile about themselves generates 125 bucks worth of value. Um, and so what, uh, back to your original question, which is what are sort of broader ramifications? Um, with these techniques, it's possible to imagine um, completely changing the basic business model of the internet because um, you can get personalized goods and services like a diagnosis, like a loan, like a recommendation about what books you might like um, without ever actually needing to transmit information about yourself um, to, to another computer, to a third party. So in theory, you could imagine completely rebooting the internet um, to still provide you stuff you want and care about um, without your data ever leaving your phone. Now, does that, however, put entrenched financial interests in the current internet at great risk? Oh God, yes. This this would be um, the, the, this would be uh, the the this would be a disaster. Um, for some of the biggest internet companies out there right now. And who, take us through why that is a disaster, just if it's not obvious to folks. Oh, well, uh, basically, uh, many large internet companies um, are uh, make their money by selling data. And the less data they have and the more difficult it is to interconnect data from multiple sources, like the purchase you just made in a store, like a bank transaction, like a uh, your current location, the more difficult it is to connect those, um, the more difficult it is to build good models about your behavior and, and interests and the less value you can extract by selling it. And just to be clear, if these features of being able to use your data securely to make a purchase decision, the people who are selling stuff will still be getting the benefit of your business. So just to be clear, the people who are losing out are these kind of Internet middle people who are uh, currently the ones who are doing the matchmaking between my interests and my data and what I might like to buy. You're painting a picture of a future where we still have the technologies to match the int my interests with potential things I could buy. So the, 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 the retailers are still perfectly happy, but those middle men and women are the ones who are losing a piece of change. And so the question is, is there a path from here to there without these entrenched issues uh, entrenched interests, just trying to put a stop to it. And what's your sense of that? I, and I know this might not be your expertise, but you've thought about it for sure. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is going way beyond what a bioengineering <laughs> professor should be talking about. But I'm sure you've noticed that Facebook for the first time ever uh, reported a loss. And part of that loss was publicly attributed to changes in security settings in iPhones. Huh. that made it more difficult to track your online behavior. So that's an example where one company is battling another company um, and based on the business models, they may be better able to, um, to do that. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna end on a negative, but I feel like I have to ask you about the potential for nefarious uses of these privacy preserving. We think of our privacy as valuable and we don't think we're generally doing really bad things. But as we all know, there are people who deal in illicit industries of drugs and other things where they would love to be able to do their transactions in a way that is pr preserving their privacy so that it can't be used as evidence in uh, trials and whatnot. So tell me about this potential other side of the coin of these privacy preserving technologies. And if you think that could be a showstopper or are there ways to manage this so that we can get the benefits without creating safe havens for bad guys? Yeah, well, again, that's a, that's like a really big question. Um, how many hours do you have? Um, maybe the we have two minutes and 54 seconds. Very good. <laughs> about this is when you use encrypted end-to-end -end encrypted messaging um, you're already taking advantage of some really amazing cryptographic techniques that allow you to communicate securely with someone else so if you want to like sell drugs or weapons or whatever else there's already technologies that allow you to communicate um, and so maybe um, all the all the all the tomes that have been written about the advantages, particularities, and limitations of encrypted end-to-end -end messaging 
um, probably apply here. And right. there's obvious dramatic benefit for individuals, but also um, uh, risks that need to be managed. And different countries are doing that in very, very different ways. And my understanding is that for these blockchain cryptocurrencies, and I know we're way far away from bioengineering now, but uh, there are um, the good news is that all of these transactions are publicly inspectable. And so you, it's not by definition uh, uh, private. It's just that if you then encrypt the information in such ways that it, it can be difficult. I'm always reminded that, you know, journalists and investigators are, have this mantra of follow the money. And if, if it becomes more difficult to follow the money, it might be more difficult to, to catch the bad guys. But, but, I, but I, you're right that there is a huge, tech, uh, a huge interest, especially among government, uh, uh, you know, law, law enforcement to make sure that these, that these technologies have at least some capability for, uh, for being hacked. Okay, but ending on a positive, uh, because that's what we want to do in the last minute. Tell me about, um, the, you started to talk about loans. Are there other uses of this outside of health? That we should be excited about, uh, and, and what and what will the real benefits to uh, law-abiding citizens be of these technologies? <laughs> well, uh, I, I I know you just said you know moving away from health, but um, I, I'm I'm really uh, most passionate yes. um, about health, and the the world I'd really like to see is where you go to your phone, and you get um, a you get um, great digital health out. And the exciting thing about digital health um, is not necessarily that it's better than humans. The really exciting thing is that the incremental cost of offering digital health tools like AI classifiers is typically very small. Once you've built a classifier, it can be very easy to offer it to a billion people instead of just one million people. And a key part of what it will take to make certain digital health tools available globally is this privacy component. Yes. Like imagine sitting on sensitive data for 3 billion people in 150 countries. So um, my fundamental drive is this notion of the technology enabling scalable digital health solutions at vanishingly low incremental cost. And that, that's really where I'd like the, the world to be soon. And that's where I'd like you know, our future to be. Great. And, and of course, there'll always be physicians in the background standing by if you need to talk to them. But this as a first entree to the healthcare system is a yeah. very compelling. Thanks to Jan Lippart. That was the future of health privacy. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman.